If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Please see our websites, BibleQuery.org, HistoryCart.com, and MuslimHope.com, and our YouTube channel, See Answers TV, which has 19 playlists dealing with multiple topics. For example, if you need video information on Jehovah's Witnesses, we have videos on that subject to help the Christian refute their claims. Likewise, our playlists cover Mormonism, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Black Muslims, regular Islam, Roman Catholicism, world religions, New Age cults, UFOs and the occult, the Campbellism, work salvation of the Church of Christ, predestination, Arminianism, phony TV preachers like Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland, and a host of other issues. We even have videos in Spanish. This presentation is on a subject I've been waiting to cover for a long time. The so-called evangelist named Charles G. Finney. I want to thank Jerry Johnson, president of NicenCouncil.com, for copyright permission to present 10 minutes from his excellent video production, Beware of False Prophets, The Case Against Charles G. Finney. Jerry has many excellent theological videos available. Please contact his ministry for more information concerning them. Before we begin this brief 10-minute excerpt from Jerry's video, let me preface the subject with the following information from Dr. Michael Horton's excellent article. You may recall the five-hour TV series I recorded with Dr. Horton on phony TV preachers. See it on YouTube. If you are teaching this, you are outside of the Christian family. You are closer to Hinduism or Buddhism or Taoism or Sufism, one of the Eastern religions, uh, but you certainly are not a Christian. I don't care if you, what church you go to, whether you say hallelujah, use the same phrases, have the same experiences. If you teach this, you are not a Christian. Uh, a heretic is a heretic is a heretic, whether he's green, purple, or, or brown. It Absolutely. doesn't matter. Yeah, you, Absolutely. This is outright blasphemy. You shall be as gods. This yeah. is right out of the Garden of Eden. Yes, and uh, what's incredible here is we, you'd mentioned a story about Tilton back here, and we got that quote about how he says uh, that man was designed or created by God to be a god of this world. And, of course, he teaches these positive confession and prosperity. We On previous shows, we played a tape where he's saying that, you know, if, if you're poor, you're in sin, yeah. and uh, you're supposed to have prosperity and all this kind of stuff. Well, with that said, I want to I wanna show the audience something about Mr. Tilton, that, uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. First, I want to play an audio tape of Mr. Tilton on one of his numerous broadcasts, uh, and you can expound after we take a quick listen to this. Here's Mr. Robert Tilton speaking, if I cue the tape up in the right place. <laughs> Let's see what we get here. Oh, we got to take it off pause. <laughs> if you'll listen closely, if you'll make a vow right now of a thousand dollars, so Bob, I can't pay it all now. I know that, but you need to make a vow of faith. You've got to be willing to let go of trusting in what you can see. God will not only open the fish's mouth and pay your bills, but it will pay the vow. He will give you seed to sow and bread, fish to eat. That's the Bible. Now, you have a choice. To believe it or to doubt it. If you have a problem, any kind of an housing, transportation, situation in a marriage, you can release the creative. See, this all works by faith. The creative force of God into existence. Release the creative force of God into existence. But it all seems to be predicated on making that vow, oh, yeah. that vow of a thousand dollars. 
and yeah. the work of God. It's clear from Robert Tilton's own theology that he has, he has, is on a, a course uh, to make money, and he will mm -hmm. invent a theology of greed to mm -hmm. endorse the lifestyle he wants to live. Yes, as we discussed already. Now, I want to show the audience here some of the typical mail-outs that Robert Tilton, I don't know which camera we got it on right now, but I'll just hold it up to this one. Uh, it's coming from the Word of Faith, World Outreach Center Church Incorporated, Robert Tilton Ministries, Dallas, Texas. Now, here's a typical envelope that goes out to, I guess, a lot of his supporters that are giving him money. And you'll see it's got a picture of Robert Tilton. Now, I'm going to put it on the board here, and we'll kind of analyze a little bit more here. I'm going to set it up here so it'll be nice and stationary, so maybe the camera can zoom in on it. This is, this is Robert Tilton right here, you know, and he likes to put his face on a lot of his envelopes. Oh, yeah. And he's got a saying here. It says, start remembering, God woke me up at 4 o'clock in the morning. What he told me in an audible voice will change your life on March the 17th. Now, this letter was sent out in the year 1991, same time we're producing this, this video series. And he says that God woke him up and talked to him in an audible voice. I've noticed a lot of these faith teachers seem to have a, a personal communication with, with Jesus. Uh, Kenneth Hagin says he's been up visited by Jesus eight times. And, and uh, the different faith teachers say, oh, God told me this and God told me that. And here he is saying that God woke him up and told him that something's going to happen on March the 17th. Now, Sounds like a, a faith healer's version of a horoscope, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Now, what I want to do is bring out a lot of the stuff he's got in this envelope. Hold it. I guess that's good enough here. I'm going to show the viewers what this man is sending out, and we'll kind of go into somewhat of a detail here. Uh, let, me, uh, let me tape this up. What he does is he puts a uh, big poster of himself inside the, uh, here we go, take a look at this, viewers, if uh, we can bring it out, puts a big poster of himself in these envelopes he sends out, and he talks about March 17th here, that's 1991, I guess, for this situation, your miracle day, okay, and he's got uh, number one, decide decision week, rush your prayer request back to me today so I will have them by March 17th, your miracle day. And then we got number two, the decree week, number three, the declare week, and your miracle day, he's got this circled off. Now, brother, you're closer to it than I am. What does he say here and what does he say? He quotes a passage of scripture. There. Ask for what you want or settle for what you get. And down here he quotes uh, Job 22, 27, and 28 from the Amplified Version, which they like to use so that they can uh, select the, the word they, they choose. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't read the same in other translations. That's right. It would mess up what they're trying to make that verse mean. That's right. You will make your prayer to him, and he will hear you, and you will pay your vows. You shall also decide and decree a thing, and it shall be established for you, and the light of God's favor shall shine upon your ways. So he's taking a passage of scripture which we would agree with. He's twisting out of context. Absolutely. And then he says, get what you need or settle what you have or something like that over there. Sounds like a gospel of greed. Oh, you know, absolutely. Now let's take a look at the other side of this thing. First, and, of, while you're doing okay. that, when we say it's a gospel of greed, we're really saying no more than exactly what Peter told us these people would be like. He says... There were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They seduce the unstable. It's absolutely amazing that false teachers and greed always go hand in hand. Exactly. Simon the magician who wanted to buy the healing power of the disciples. And what did Peter say? May your money and you both go to hell. That's right. That's exactly, Acts chapter 8. Exactly what Peter said. And then uh, look what Elsie does here. And this is the other side of that poster. He's got his face here and Jesus right there. Your miracle date is set. What would you have me to do for you? It's like Jesus, you know, he's like your, your uh, little servant boy. You just mm -hmm. clap your hands, snap your fingers, say, here, boy, and tell Jesus what you want him to do for you. And uh, he's got this prophetic word from the Lord, and he says, The Lord spoke to me and told me how you and I can have a miracle harvest every time. This revelation that I've shared with you in this letter will literally change your life. Here's what Jesus said to me about this revelation. Now he's got quotes here, and he quotes 
what Jesus told him. You know, and he goes on, these truths are the things you were doing that caused your faith to, uh, uh, let's see, what did it say here? These truths are things you were doing that caused your faith to bring about and to bring uh, into existence what you were believing me for. It's that Boy, same Jesus thing. has terrible grammar. Yeah. And, I uh, mean, if this is <laughs> coming from Jesus, it really, horrible grammar. Yeah, you think he could speak better. I That's thought he right. did a better job in the scriptures. He That's seemed right. to have, speak pretty well there. That's right. Uh, and, he, and he's given this thing like, speak into existence, the very mm -hmm. thing we were talking about before. And he just goes on with all this stuff. Charles Grandison Finney was an early 19th century revivalist in the northeastern part of the United States and a kindred spirit of John Wesley. Wesley was steeped deeply in the writings of Roman Catholic medieval mystics, claimed to have had read them avidly, and was instrumental in publishing a great number of these Roman Catholic works. This false mysticism stayed with Wesley all his life. Finney doctrinalized Wesley's, quote, second experience, end quote, teaching. Finney's introduction of new methods for getting converts and the orchestrating of emotion and excitement in huge revival gatherings was clearly based on his heretical understanding of being born again. Finney writes that he repudiated all the fundamental doctrines of God's sovereignty and salvation, including the vicarious nature of the atonement of Jesus Christ in the interests of preaching revival. Finney's purpose was solely to convince the human will, and produce decisions and commitments. Dr. Horton of Whitehorse Inn Radio fame states, The disturbing legacy of Charles Finney. No single man is more responsible for the distortion of Christian truth in our age than Charles Grandison Finney. His, quote, new measures, end quote, created a framework for modern decision theology and evangelical revivalism. Jerry Falwell calls him, quote, one of my heroes and a hero to many evangelicals, including Billy Graham, end quote. I recall wandering through the Billy Graham Center some years ago, observing the place of honor given to Charles Finney in the evangelical tradition, reinforced by the first class in theology I had at a Christian college where Finney's work was required reading. The New York revivalist was the oft-quoted and celebrated champion of the Christian singer Keith Green and the Youth with the Mission organization. He is particularly esteemed among the leaders of the Christian right and the Christian left by both Jerry Falwell and Jim Wallace, Sojourners magazine. And his imprint can be seen in movements that appear to be diverse, but in reality are merely heirs to Finney's legacy, from the Vineyard Movement and the Christian Growth Movement to the political and social crusades, tele-evangelism, and the Promise Keepers Movement, as a former Wheaton College president rather glowingly cheered, quote, Finney lives on, end quote. Finney is the tallest marker in the shift from Reformation orthodoxy evident in the Great Awakening under Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield to Arminian, indeed even Pelagian, revivalism, evident from the Second Great Awakening to the present. To demonstrate the debt of modern evangelicalism to Finney, we must first notice his theological departures. Finney did believe that Christ died for something, not for someone, but for something. In other words, he died for a purpose, but not for people. The purpose of that death was to reassert God's moral government and to lead us to eternal life by example, as Adam's example excited us to sin. Why did Christ die? God knew that, quote, the atonement would present to creatures the highest possible motives to virtue. Example is the highest moral influence that can be exerted. If the benevolence manifested in the atonement does not subdue the selfishness of sinners, their case is hopeless, end quote. Page 209. Therefore, 
We are not helpless sinners who need to, quote, be redeemed, but wayward sinners who need a demonstration of selflessness so moving that we will be excited to leave off selfishness. Not only did Finney believe that the, quote, moral influence, end quote, theory of the atonement was the chief way of understanding the cross, he explicitly denied the substitutionary atonement, which, quote, assumes that the atonement was a literal payment of a debt, which we have seen does not consist with the nature of the atonement. It is true that the atonement of itself does not secure the salvation of anyone, end quote, from Finney's book, page 217. Then there is the matter of applying redemption. Throwing off Reformation orthodoxy, Finney argued strenuously against the belief that the new birth is a divine gift, insisting that, quote, regeneration consists in the sinner changing his ultimate choice, intention, preference, or in changing from selfishness to love or benevolence, end quote. As moved by the moral influence of Christ's moving example, that's from page 224 of Finney's book, quote, original sin, physical regeneration, and all their kindred and resulting dogmas are alike subversive of the gospel and repulsive to the human intelligence, end quote, page 236 from Finney. Having nothing to do with original sin, a substitutionary atonement, and the supernatural character of the new birth, Finney proceeds to attack, quote, the article by which the church stands or falls, end quote, justification by grace alone through faith alone. Distorting the cardinal doctrine of justification, the reformers insisted on the basis of clear biblical text that justification in the Greek quote, to declare righteous, end quote, rather than, quote, to make righteous, end quote, was a forensic, i.e. legal, verdict. In other words, whereas Rome maintained that justification was a process of making a bad person better, the reformers argued that it was a declaration or pronouncement that had someone else's righteousness, i.e. Christ, as its basis. Therefore, it was perfect, once and for all verdict, of right standing. This declaration was to be pronounced at the beginning of the Christian life, not in the middle or at the end. The key words in the evangelical doctrine are forensic, legal, and imputation, crediting one's account as opposed to the idea of infusion of a righteousness within a person's soul. Knowing all this, Finney declares, quote, but for sinners to be forensically pronounced just is impossible and absurd. As we shall see, there are many conditions, while there is but one ground of the justification of sinners. As has already been said, there can be no justification in a legal or forensic sense, but upon the ground of universal, perfect, and uninterrupted obedience to law. This is, of course, denied by those who hold that gospel justification or the justification of penitent sinners is of the nature of a forensic or judicial justification. They hold to the legal maxim that what a man does by another, he does by himself, and therefore the law regards Christ's obedience as ours on the ground that he obeyed for us, end quote. To this, Finney replies, Quote, the doctrine of imputed righteousness or that Christ's obedience to the law was accounted as our obedience is founded on a most false and nonsensical assumption, end quote. After all, Christ's righteousness, quote, could do no more than justify himself. It can never be imputed to us. It was naturally impossible then for him to obey in our behalf, end quote. This quote, representing of the atonement as the ground of the sinner's justification has been a sad occasion of stumbling to many, end quote, from pages 320 to 322 in Finney's book. 
The view that faith is the sole condition of justification is, quote, the antinomian view, end quote, Finney asserts. Quote, we shall see that perseverance in obedience to the end of life is also a condition of justification. Some theologians have made justification a condition of sanctification instead of making sanctification a condition of justification. But this, we shall see, is an erroneous view of the subject. End quote. Pages 326 to 327. Finney today, as the noted Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield pointed out so eloquently, there are throughout history only two religions. Heathenism, of which Pelagianism is a religious expression and a supernatural redemption. With Warfield and those who so seriously warned their brothers and sisters of these errors among Finney and his successors, we too must come to terms with the wildly heterodox strain in American Protestantism. With roots in Finney's revivalism, perhaps evangelical and liberal Protestantism are not that far apart after all. His, quote, new measures, end quote, like today's church growth movement, made human choices and emotions the center of the church's ministry, ridiculed theology, and replaced the preaching of Christ with the preaching of conversion. The belief that the new birth and revival depend necessarily on divine activity is pernicious. Quote, no doctrine, end quote, he says, quote, is more dangerous than this is to the prosperity of the church and nothing more absurd, end quote. That's from his book, Revivals of Religion, pages four and five. When the leaders of the church growth movement claim that theology gets in the way of growth and insists that it does not matter what a particular church believes, growth is the matter of following the proper principles, they are displaying their debt to Finney. When leaders of the vineyard movement praise the sub-Christian enterprise and the barking, roaring, screaming, laughing, and other strange phenomenon on the basis that, quote, it works, end quote, and one must judge its truth by its fruits, they are following Finney, as well as the father of American pragmatism, William James, who declared that truth must be judged on the basis of, quote, its cash value in experiential terms, end quote. Thus, in Finney's theology, God is not sovereign, man is not a sinner by nature, the atonement is not a true payment for sin, justification by imputation is insulting to reason and morality, the new birth is simply the effect of successful techniques, and revival is a natural result of clever campaigns. In his fresh introduction to the bicentennial edition of Finney's Systematic Theology, Harry Kahn commends Finney's pragmatism. Quote, Many servants of our Lord shall be diligently searching for a gospel that works, and I am happy to state they can find it in this volume. End quote. As Whitney R. Cross has carefully documented, the stretch of territory in which Finney's revivals were most frequent was also the cradle of the perfectionistic cults that plagued that century. A gospel that, quote, works, end quote, for zealous perfectionists, one moment merely creates tomorrow's disillusioned and spent super saints. Needless to say, Finney's message is radically different from the evangelical faith as is the basic orientation of the movements we see around us today that bear his imprint, such as revivalism, or its modern label, the church growth movement, or Pentecostal perfectionism and emotionalism, or political triumphalism, based on the ideal of, quote, Christian America, end quote, or the anti-intellectual and anti-doctrinal tendencies of many American evangelicals and fundamentalists. Not only did the revivalists abandon the doctrine of justification, making him a renegade against evangelical Christianity, he repudiated doctrines such as original sin and the substitutionary atonement that have been embraced by Roman Catholics and Protestants alike. Therefore, Finney is not merely an Arminian, 
but a Pelagian. He is not only an enemy of evangelical Protestantism, but of historic Christianity of the broadest sense. Pelagianism in church history has been condemned as an anti-Christian heresy because it combines works with your salvation. And of course, we know from Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, and others that you're saved not by your works, but by grace through faith. And now for a brief clip from the NicenCouncil.com video, Beware of False Prophets, the case against Charles G. Finney. Suppose a general was going to launch a campaign against an enemy camp, your camp. If he's a good commander, one of the things he would do prior to the assault is to dispatch intelligence agents to infiltrate your ranks. Though their objectives would be many, one of their primary goals would be to spread disinformation in the hopes that this would cause panic and confusion prior to their assault. Knowing that these infiltrators are in your ranks, how would you go about identifying them? These enemy operatives would look just like you. They would talk with the same accent, employ the same verbiage, and dress as you dress. In short, in every way, they would behave just like you and your countrymen. As a mole inside your camp, they would even appear zealous for your cause, quote your leaders, and appeal to your laws. For such, wrote the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The great Baptist commentator John Gill explained it this way. They put on the form and air of faithful, upright ministers of the word and would be thought to be such. They mimic gospel preachers who assert the doctrine of justification by the righteousness of Christ, though they most miserably corrupt it and blend it with something of their own. This warning to the Corinthians is similar to the warning the apostle gave to the elders of Ephesus. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. 
This was not the first time that churches had heard this plea to be on guard. For the apostle cautioned church leaders to lay hands suddenly on no man. In fact, the Lord Jesus himself warned years before, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Many Christians seem to believe that the fruits spoken of here are the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that if an individual personifies these traits, he must be one of the good guys, one of us. But are the fruits of the Spirit what our Lord meant? Couldn't an unsaved person mimic these fruits? Couldn't they show kindness, love, and gentleness? And wouldn't you expect a masquerading angel of righteousness to do just that, appear righteous? To imitate the fruits of the Spirit to the point that outwardly they seem blameless. Aren't Christ and his apostles warning us that their seemingly righteous acts, pious speech, and supposed love for the kingdom are the very thing which makes identification so difficult? John Calvin echoed this understanding when he wrote, Now we must see what fruits in particular Christ intends. For I believe it is wrong when people confine this to our way of life. Often, some of the worst impostors put on a fake holiness and trade in all sorts of garbs betoking austerity in life. So this test would be quite ineffectual. Calvin rightly observes that if the test of a false prophet were simply examining their supposedly virtuous life, it would be a very uncertain test indeed and of very little help. Please understand that these questions are not meant to downplay the importance of the fruits of the Spirit in the lives of God's children. They are vital, and each one of us should strive to make these fruits more visible in our own lives. But the question still remains. If Jesus did not mean the fruits of the Spirit, then what did he mean? Well, I call your attention to the Lord's preceding statement, beware of false prophets. To answer the question about which fruits the Lord Jesus is referencing, we need to ask the question, what are the fruits of a false prophet? The answer is false prophecy. Continuing with Calvin's comment, but Christ did not wish his teaching to undergo such an unfair and also uncertain judgment as to be reckoned by the life that men lead. So by fruits, it is the very way of teaching which we must understand which in fact holds first priority. Let us state it again. The fruit of a false prophet is false prophecy. So what is prophecy? Prophecy can take two basic forms. One is foretelling, that is predictive prophecy. This type reveals an event to transpire in the future. Another is foretelling, that is the prophetic pronouncement. This type instructs people regarding the will of God. Both of these are functions of the divinely ordained prophetic office. The prophet's mandate was to instruct the people in the word of God and to proclaim the truth. In other words, to teach God's doctrine. With the transition from the old covenant to the new, this responsibility was given to the apostles. And since the close of the canon and the cessation of the miraculous revelatory gift of prophecy, we now have teachers and preachers who expound and exegete the word of God revealed in scripture. If there is any doubt that it is their false prophecy or teaching which we as fruit inspectors are called to test, consider the words of the apostle Peter. But there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Let's examine this passage in a little more detail. Peter, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us, one, there were false prophets among the people. These were pretenders to the prophetic office who continually troubled the Old Testament saints. 
God warned Israel about these men in Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 through 22. Two, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Here, God connects the dots for us by equating false prophets of the past with false teachers in the present. These false teachers have the same spirit and objective as their Old Testament counterparts. Three, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. The false teachers privily, meaning secretly or covertly, teach false doctrine which has an element of truth and therefore sounds legitimate. However, if believed, will damn the souls of their followers. Remember, the entire video is available from NicenCouncil.com. Finney was a heretic and in the end claimed that God was not sovereign. Man is not a sinner by nature. Justification is not imputed. The new birth is produced by successful techniques and revivals are produced by emotional appeals. To refute this non-biblical theology, please see our predestination series on YouTube. Simply type Larry Wessel's predestination in the YouTube search box. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 we read, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 